As he was both the son of a painter and the nephew of a painter, Mondrian's awareness of art developed within his family. He was born on March 7, 1872, into a strictly Calvinist Dutch family, and was soon followed by four younger brothers and a sister. Since his father, Pieter Cornelius Mondrian, was principal of the Christian reformist school at Amersfoort and qualified to teach drawing, the young Piet Mondrian grew up surrounded not only by his father's drawings and prints, but also by religious devotion and a commitment to teaching. The family moved to Winterswick in 1880, when Piet's father was appointed headmaster of a primary school there. Mondrian's first commitment was to become a drawing teacher. He was awarded a diploma qualifying him for elementary school teaching in 1889 and a further diploma for secondary school teaching in 1892. He appeared to be following his father's footsteps, yet he never became a teacher. By the age of 20, his intentions were clear. He left Winterswick for the Academy of Fine Art in Amsterdam with a firm commitment to painting. If his father initiated Mondrian's commitment to art, it was his uncle, Fritz Mondrian, 1853 to 1932, who really involved him in painting. In the 1890s, uncle and nephew frequently painted and drew together in the landscape, producing oil sketches along the River Gein, a theme to which the young Mondrian was to return many times. Fritz Mondrian gave Piet his first glimpses of wider horizon and provided him with a direct link with the Hague School, which, in the later 19th century, blended French and Dutch techniques into a powerful force in Holland. After three years full-time study at the Amsterdam Royal Academy, Mondrian continued to attend evening classes while trying to relieve his financial needs by copying paintings. Mondrian was a man of great simplicity. He had no wife, no children to enrich and complicate the simplicity of his daily life, to impose comfort upon him, or to upset the stillness of the studio where he lived and found real measure of his world. As his career developed from Dutch landscape painter to artist of international influence upon art and design, Mondrian cultivated the simplicity of his studio life with a growing severity and concentration. Mondrian was an aesthetic of a rare kind. He deliberately reduced his means to the minimum. It gave him immense concentration and increasing influence. This enigmatic and impressive man was a philosopher who painted and a painter given to philosophical thought. His goal was to discern an underlying structure in the world and to indicate this, as a mathematician might, by means of the fewest, clearest elements available, removing all clutter, paring away everything inessential to reveal the barest, most economical solution. What Mondrian makes in paintings is movement in stillness, an energy which the viewer can witness in action. They are both sensual and intellectual, personal and impersonal. By the end of his life, he was an artist of international reputation, but his first one-man show preceded his death by only two years. Self-Portrait, 1900. While this is a directly observed study by the young Mondrian and contains no symbolic images, it achieves an icon-like intensity by its central and symmetrical placing of the head. All that is unnecessary or superfluous is edited out, and the artist has presented an image of himself that is intense, alert, intellectual, and in the power of the eyes reflected in his mirror, hypnotic. His head is strictly vertical, and the eyes, with their dark brows, form a firm horizontal line which Mondrian was careful to reiterate in the line of his shirt collar. Here is a painter of profound introspection and self-scrutiny. Houses with Poplars, 1900. Still Life with Plaster Bust, 
1900. This is an intricate and studied composition in which he took care to fix precisely the position of the objects and planes within the painting. The background wall, parallel to the picture plane, is dominated by the concentric circles of the reflective bowl, fixing the precise focal point of its center level with the head of the plaster bust, which precedes the firm, vertical emphasis at left. The level surface of the tabletop which supports the bust is embellished with a sprig of flowers that also indicates the shallow recession of the picture space. Mathematical in the precision of its arrangement, this still life positions every surface and object in space by a strict control of shapes and lines across the flat canvas. Nothing is left to chance. This is a tour de force of controlled technique, manipulating the shape and texture of objects into a composition of monumental rigidity. View of Farmhouse, 1898-1900. Farm with line of washing, 1900. A sharp receding perspective gives depth and volume to the farm buildings. By contrast, the line of washing placed across the canvas creates a compositional theme with variations which rhythmically articulates the surface of the painting like a flat screen across the illusion of depth. House on the River Gain, 1900. The house, inscribed 1741 in large figures across its wide, low gable end, is viewed from across the river, so that its reflection is clearly visible in the water which fills the lower half of the canvas. By viewing the house frontally, the artist ensured that the broad triangle of its end wall is complemented by its inverted reflection to establish a square shape balanced upon its point. This device, which Mondrian was to use periodically throughout his career, forces a contrast between the flat geometry of this composition and the air and light which evoke the space of recession in his painting. Standing upon the earth of the riverbank, the house sits firmly within the air and light of the countryside. In its reflection, its triangular shape shimmers in the water. The riverbank which divides the air from the water also divides the canvas. In the Dutch landscape, the human dwelling was established precariously between air and water. The farm needed both elements, and the human dwelling, starkly geometric among the rounded forms of trees, was the means to control and use the forces of nature. Windmill by the Water, 1900-1904 the image of the windmill more overtly signified man's precarious control of natural forces. In this painting, Mondrian repeated the device of the triangular shape reflected in water, although here it is empty space defined by the edge of the windmill's sail and the struts attached to the mill. Again, the square shape, which Mondrian later inaccurately called the lozenge, dominates the composition linking in its upper half the air which turns the windmill's sails to the watery reflection below. The massive mill raises its bulk upon a slender surface of earth that divides the painting horizontally. The fence and its reflection emphasize this. He is composing this painting with elaborate care and finding in the geometry of his composition a means to show the poise with which the mill articulates those natural forces of air and water that define its shape and purpose. The Factory, 1900. He built this composition upon similar lines of geometry, contrasting the tall factory chimneys, which continue down through their reflections to the bottom edge of the painting, against the dominant horizontal of his canvas. Within this simple, flat division of the canvas, the rising mass of the factory is reflected in the water to form a compressed lozenge shape. What inhabits the air above inhabits the water below. Between air and water, the bulk of the factory exemplifies human activity perched upon a shallow plateau of earth. Landscape 1902-03 
a vigorously worked landscape dominated by an immense and luminous sky reduces interruptions on the horizon to a few small marks, while the features of the flat land recede rapidly towards it, so that the broad foreground handling falls away to little more than a line at the horizon. In the sky, the swirling clouds reduce with equal rapidity to narrow bands of light and shade. The swirl of clouds provides a focus of attention in a limitless space, which radiates upwards, outwards, and forwards. In this painting, it is the sky which is the source of energy. It is the source of light and the swirling forms of clouds, themselves a confusion of air and water, dwarf the features of the landscape below. Landscape by the Moonlight, 1902-03. This, a possible pair to the previous painting, is similarly dominated by the light and movement of clouds and air, now lit by a pale and evocative moon above a landscape of trees and flat fields. Movement is suggested by the handling of paint in both works, while the color and tonality define the light. These paintings contrast the light of the sun and the reflected light of the moon. Tree on the Kelfi, 1901-1902. In Tree on the Kelfi, the river recedes languidly to a vanishing point above the center of the painting. The horizon is high, and in the foreground, a single stark and leafless tree links the lower and upper edges of the canvas. Mondrian's viewpoint is central, and he chose this position with care, so that the river seems to expand across the bottom of his painting. Tree on the Kelfi, 1901-1902. In this related square painting, two trees dominate the foreground, and the river curves away to the right. Both paintings flatten the picture space by giving distinct shape and clear edges to trees, riverbanks, and water. The middle distance is defined by a small footbridge in one and by the curving riverbank in the other. There are in effect two subjects, trees and river. Trees by the River Gyne, 1898. The device of a screen of trees was being used by Mondrian perhaps as early as 1898, while painting on the River Gyne. The uprights are extended in reflections dividing the horizon into a series of rhythmic intervals. There is no loss of atmosphere or description, yet the forceful pattern of trees and their echoed reflections emphatically divide the canvas. Linear perspective is minimized and surface pattern predominates. The White Cow, 1903. This uses the screening device of trees without reflections, and the horizon is now replaced by a fence to stress the horizontal. The trees and the fence frame a painting within a painting, focusing attention upon the cows as a view through the screen. The only residual hint of perspective here is provided by imaginary lines from the lower corners of the canvas through to the central motif of animals. The trees are in leaf, spraying across the upper canvas to form a dark band corresponding to the dark foreground below. The Amstel, 1903. The mass of trees spreads up from the horizontal riverbank. This is not incidental detail, but the dominant shape within the painting to which everything is related. It fixes the focus of the painting at the left of center, while the light seen through the trees further right provides an empty counterpoint to this solid mass. This spatial arrangement, together with the overall shape of the trees, causes an interplay of both positive and negative across the canvas and into its picture space. Trees along the Gyne, 1902-03. The thin tree trunks, before reaching a feathery band of leaves, mark out clear intervals across the canvas like a musical notation. Three close trees, 
and then four trees more widely spaced, terminating in an eighth tree at the margin of the canvas, establish first a tight, then a spacious, and then a broad division of the picture space. The tentative irregularity of the tree trunks prevents too systematic an appearance. They still read as living individual trees observed and recorded by the painter and not as simple repetitions, but they mark out space across the canvas and suggest extension of the landscape beyond the painting's edge. Farm Shed, 1905. Using a spacious screen of four tall, thin trees and a low horizon, Mondrian suggests a view through the screen to an expansive, distant space. The farm is dwarfed by the scale of its surroundings and even by the scale of brush marks used both at the base of the painting and in the rhythmic, repetitive movement of the leafy branches spread out against the sky. The trees which link earth and sky appear immense and vibrate with vitality. Placed almost symmetrically, they enclose three sections of the distant landscape, and because of their symmetry, the central section dominates, implying the vanishing point of single-point perspective. This is emphasized further by the trees at the edges of the painting, which were outwards, as if the central expanse of light and space were pushing them apart. At the Lappenbrink, Wintersfake, 1904. Farm at Nissel Road, 1904. Seen frontally and at close quarters, the doors and walls of the barns form loose rectangles across the painting, subdivided by small openings and boards parallel to the picture plane, making small containers of visual incidents and variations. Geometry underpined a wealth of detailed description in which every brick found its place. Mondrian employs diagonals for gable ends, but no clear vanishing point. This is achieved by avoiding any three-quarter views of objects, requiring their side elevations to recede from the viewer, and by keeping the foreground free of perspective lines. A flatter articulation of the picture plane results. Farm on a Canal, 1903-06. The familiar motif of a reflection of farm wall, door, and window in the lower part of the painting was used. This visual repetition stresses further the flat surface of the painting by causing the eye to move across the canvas to recognize the repeated shapes. In this way, the dominant horizontal lines of the water's edge and the line of the roof gutting are crossed by the vertical lines which carry through visually from both window and door to the reflections below them. The French Mill on the River Gyne, 1905-07. Woman with a Child in Front of a Farm, 1904-05. A simple human subject is placed against a facade. In each case, the figure is fixed against the line of a building, the wall of which is firmly parallel to the picture plane and is itself presented as a rectangle, with smaller rectangles of doors and windows within it. While Mondrian appears to address conventions of 17th century Dutch painting, he also adjusts them by minimizing recession to produce a shallower picture space in which only the overlapping figures against a background implies depth in the painting. Mill at Evening, 1905. The watery foreground reflects the mill and the strip of land is suspended across the broad canvas between the light of the sky and its reflection in the water. As it expands laterally off the canvas, it evokes the calm stillness of evening over the wide fields, an emphasis interrupted only by the stark bulk of the mill's silhouette, which Mondrian has painted in strict symmetry, the strut of its sails in line with the axis of the mill, so that its other sails are balanced and level. These crossing struts reflect both the horizon itself and the edges of the canvas in a succinct and harmonious contrast of flat landscape and the upright construction of man within it. 
Horizontal is identified with the expanse of nature and vertical with human construction. Mill on the Gyne by Moonlight, 1906-07. In this painting, the horizon is sharp and clear, and in separating out the lower struts of the mill's mechanism, the artist has suggested a downward-pointing triangle, like a smaller reflection of the large triangle defined by the limits of the windmill's sails. As both are symmetrical around the axis of the mill, the emergent lozenge shape suggests both descent and ascent. The Mill, 1905-06. Summer Night, 1906-07. Dying Sunflower, 1907-08. Remarkably, the decay and death which artists have so frequently depicted in a human setting is here displayed as a stage in the life of a flower. The dramatically emotive lines of the painting are inappropriate to still life. As an image of the material decay and collapse of a living plant, it has the expressive power of a portrait. Dying Chrysanthemum, 1908. This slightly larger painting signals a further examination of the decay of a radiant flower. As these living creatures succumb to dissolution, they collapse from vigorous upward growth towards the earth and rebirth. If the sunflower recalls the sun, the chrysanthemum recalls the moon. Birth, growth, and decay form a cycle. Chrysanthemum, 1909. Devotion, 1908, was the title given by Mondrian to a contemporary profile portrait of a young girl. With her head raised, she stares upwards beyond the hovering image of a chrysanthemum in full bloom. Red and blue dominate the painting. Passionflower, 1908. Passionflower is a strictly edited and symmetrical composition. As a result, any variety and change in the painting occurs only up and down the central axis in a rhythmic sequence which emphasizes the upward movement of the raised and introspective face. On the shore, 1907-09, the centrally placed clouds rising above the sea in On the Shore repeat the motif of an ascending triangular mass but transferred to the shifting atmosphere of expansive seascape. On the seashore depicted here, the forces of nature are engaged in a constantly shifting balance of land against sea, of water in the landscape and water in the dramatic cloud shapes of the air, by daylight, at evening, and by moonlight. Landscape by Moonlight, 1907-08. The Old Watermill at Oel with Moon, 1907. Moon Landscape. 1907. Trees reflected in the River Gyne, 1905. Sheepfold in the Evening, 1906. Trees by the Gyne in the Moonlight, 1907-08. The tree was a living creature, balancing the energies of air, light, water, and earth in the midst of which it grew, flourished, and declined. Here, the gray-green trees are seen against the light of the red sky and yellow moon. The handling of their foliage retains the movement of the gestures which made these marks, adding an intense vitality to the image. Red replaces the dominant green of the earlier treatment, and the focal point seen through the screen of trees is now the moon set in a red sky. Farm with cattle and willows 1904. Farm at Duivendrecht, 1906. Farm at Duivendrecht, 1907. The gaunt, irregular, and leafless branches silhouetted against the sky have become rhythmic, curving forms. The twisting branches form small curves, a cellular screen through which the sky is seen. The luminosity of the sky between the dark branches makes these small cells glow, and although they depict empty space, 
they now appear as globules of light and color between the bounding contours of dark branches. The Red Tree, 1908-10. Here, Mondrian is refining the elaborate interplay of foreground and background by which the solid trunk of the tree was seen to disperse itself through branches and twigs into the empty space around it. Mondrian chose a tree that was twisted in its growth, its branches subdividing into the air from the solid, arched, and forking trunk. What was single and solid expands outwards into a multitude of thin, curving lines. Among those branches, the empty space of the surrounding air is resolved into a cellular structure. Mill in Sunlight, 1908. Mondrian adopts the pointillist techniques of evoking light, but the mill itself remains the single massive dominant image. There is little attempt to evoke a single coherent light. The primary colors, each with its unique qualities and associations, are revealed as the elements which create all the diversity of observed color. Seascape at Sunset, 1909. Both shore and sea extend off the sides of the canvas. The only movement lay in the encroaching water and resisting shore. Nothing human is visible to make this conjunction of land, sea, and sky specific in time and space. In this sense, the theme is eternal. Beach at Domburg, 1909. The smooth expanse of sea is contrasted against the scattered brush strokes of the beach, whilst the sky is a mass of regular marks forming a wall of color. Sea at Sunset, 1909. The downward expansion of reflected light from the sun implies a high central focus, which acts like a vanishing point to evoke the enormous space of the sky and sea. Dune 1, 1909. The sand dune, shaped by wind and sea, rises up gently. The dunes, barriers to the ocean's encroachment, act like foreground mountains in a shifting landscape, ceaselessly adjusted by opposing natural forces. Dune 2, 1909. Mondrian's pointillist brushwork, as well as describing light and color, emphasizes the slowly rising curve of the dunes, echoed by the curve of the water that encircles and undermines them. Dune 3, 1909. Dune 6, 1910. The ascending triangle of the dune finds its counterpart in the descending slow curve of the foreground. The shore erects its monumental mass against the sea. Landscape with Dunes, 1910. Observing the sea and shore, Mondrian sought its rhythms, which in this painting are the water's movements recorded in the sand. The Lighthouse at West Capel, 1909-10. This painting is related in theme to the seascapes. Projecting to enormous height from the low horizon, it is part of the battle of sea and land, of nature and man its light providing guidance and protection for the seafarer. The sequence of window openings on two sides rise like the hieroglyphics on an obelisk to the pointed roof line, which makes the lantern almost invisible. The Church at Domburg, 1910. The Mill at Domburg, the Red Mill, 1910. The mill looms up against the sky its base fixed in the earth, and its sails articulating the movements of air, a man-made link between sky and earth. The mill, painted with uncompromising frontility and symmetry, is pierced by a pointed window, acting as an arrow to the chevron shape dramatically reinforced by the lower sails that dominate the upper canvas. Evolution, 1910-11. At left, a woman raises her face in meditation. At right, her inner experience is indicated by geometric colored forms appearing like an aura beside her. In the larger central panel, she is transformed into a spiritual being 
as her enormous eyes open upon mystical enlightenment. Spiritual aspiration is associated with a simplified human form, which in the side panels incorporates the rising triangular chevron shape in shoulders, chin, mouth, and slant of eyes. Still Life with Ginger Jar 1, 1911-12. Still Life with Ginger Jar 2, 1912. The round jar remains central and the foreground fold is preserved. Only the clear blue of the jar and the white of the cloth are easily recognized as objects. Around them in subdued grayed colors of similar tones, different objects become indistinguishable and are reduced to a series of simplified interconnecting contours. Female figure, 1912. Nude, 1911-12. A subject rarely attempted by Mondrian is a whitish figure emerging from surrounding planes of dull gray-green. The structure of lines resolutely adheres to the picture plane. Only tone suggests emergence and depth. The artist's favored frontal view is evident again in the figure and in the planes which surround her. Even the breasts and shoulders are defined by straight lines. Tree, 1911 12. The new impact of cubism is evident, while the painting makes a revealing comparison with the red tree. Cubism has led him to relinquish detail, and the curved organic cross motif is clearer as a result and reveals an implied circle of lines around the center of the painting and the core of its image. Composition with Trees 2, 1912. Gray Tree, 1912. Apple Tree in Flower, 1912. The tree has no recognizable flowers, and the tree is not easy to discern, yet its image remains central and plays an important role in coordinating the rhythmic structure, even if it is less accessible to recognition. Background and foreground fully interlock, and Modrian has employed only the straight line and elliptical curve to construct the intersecting planes of his painting. Tree, 1912. Composition number three, 1912-13. Only knowledge of related works makes the tree trunk identifiable in the lower center area. The branching lines move up and outwards with a discernible rhythm, but it is doubtful whether this painting, seen in isolation, recognizably depicts a tree. Oval Composition with Trees, 1913. Here the oval is upright and contains a myriad of muted yellow ochre lines and planes which constantly interrupt each other, forming uniquely a kind of zigzag passage across the canvas. The image has wholly succumbed to rhythm and depiction has become secondary to construction in the painting. Composition in gray-blue, 1912-13. Facade in tan and gray, 1913-14. A cellular structure is constructed almost entirely of horizontal and vertical lines, so that the planes which these lines enclose remain parallel to the picture plane. They are assembled across the canvas. Within this otherwise homogeneous framework, two diagonals and a few horizontal elliptical curves appear. Larger planes dominate the lower half of the painting, while the horizontal lines flank the center and the smaller planes occupy the upper space. Composition number 14, 1913. A painting with a cellular structure assembling small flat planes into a gently oval format. Just as the tree motif, a natural form was reduced to an essential rhythmic structure from which all specific detailed description has vanished. Composition number nine, blue facade, 1913-14. Composition in blue and pink. Composition in line and color, 1913. Mondrian organized its rectangular planes into a cross motif. 
This is achieved by assembling a preponderance of horizontal planes in one direction and of vertical planes in the other, with almost square planes elsewhere. Composition in Gray and Yellow, 1913. This composition is a wide cityscape. Its rhythms resolve into a T-shape rather than a cross, and it is likely that this painting is based upon the railway terminus of Montparnasse. The latticework motif along the top edge is perhaps a railway bridge or other iron structure, and the almost square shapes left and right of center suggest buildings. Oval composition with light colors. Color planes in oval, 1913-14. Oval Composition, 1914. This composition exhibits a new sense of color, dominated by the emergence of red, yellow, and blue, though not as primary colors. Darker tones in the lower parts progress to lighter tones at the top, suggesting distance and atmosphere in a painting which uses flat shapes only and permits as few diagonals as possible. Oval Composition. Painting 3, 1914. Composition number 6, 1914. Pier and Ocean, 1914. This has a characteristic unique in Mondrian's work. It is symmetrical around its central vertical axis, a literal example of balance. The axis is marked by a sequence of vertical lines, which are the only lines not repeated. Pier and Ocean, composition number 10, 1915. This image is not symmetrical, and none of the lines form closed rectangles or squares. The white space is continuous throughout the painting, and is without color, without curves, without diagonal lines, without solid imagery, an insubstantial, restless, glittering record of the ocean's movement. Composition with Lines, Composition in black and white, 1917. Composition with colors, A. Composition in planes of pure color on white background, 1917. This canvas features a red square or near square above the middle of the painting. It is the largest rectangle and its central position makes it visually static. The two longest black lines are associated with this red triangle. Around it hover other rectangles of red, blue, and yellow, appearing to reach out into the surrounding space of white from this focus. Composition with Colors B, 1917. This composition shares all of the qualities of Composition with Colors A, but the black lines are fewer. Mill at Evening, 1916. The mill is seen from a low viewpoint, so that it rears its bulk against a sky filled with a cellular pattern of moonlit clouds. Self-Portrait, 1918. Elegantly dressed in urbane suit and bow tie, clean shaven with not a hair out of place, the philosopher painter casts his challenging gaze at the mirror and thereby at the viewer of his canvas. Behind him hangs, like a manifesto of his views, a painting composed of rectangles, all their sides perpendicular and strictly parallel. Composition with Color Planes, 1918, is one of a series of canvases in which rectangles of color appear to float against a background of white. There is no overlapping and no black, only two planes touch, and some planes go off the canvas edge. Lozenge with Gray Lines, 1918, is a square canvas presented in the diagonal format with a point at top and bottom. Like a chessboard, it is subdivided into 64 smaller squares, eight along each edge. Within this structure, Mondrian introduced irregularity by the simple means of thickening sections of the horizontal and vertical lines. Lozenge with gray lines, composition in black and gray, 1919. Lozenge with light colors and gray lines, 1919. 
Lozenge, 1919. Muted grays, blues, and yellows fill the planes which the grid establishes. As the lines always continue beyond the limits of the rectangles, they appear to define interlocking planes rather than solid objects, and visual movement follows the lines deflected by crossings and terminal conjunctions across the whole canvas. The underlying geometric grid means that all of these planes and lines are interrelated proportionately to each other as multiples in length or area of the small square unit. Composition with light colors and gray lines, 1919. Checkerboard with light colors, 1919. The rectangles are all of the same proportion as the whole. Only color provides irregular structure within this. Mondrian's mathematics were still mystical, and the movement relied upon proportion as well as the kinetics of color and position. Checkerboard with dark colors, 1919. Composition with gray, red, yellow, and blue, 1920. Composition with red, blue, black, and yellow green, composition C, 1920. Composition with red, yellow, blue, and black, 1921. This painting has narrow marginal planes, while the great red square dominates the remaining area, which itself approximates to a square, although this is interrupted at the lower left. The red square also forms a strong diagonal as its right and lower lines cross over to form a smaller square, or near square, itself divided horizontally. A pair of identical rectangles above this restore the vertical theme, and a similar arrangement occurs to the left. The lines, colors, and their proportions all suggest movement within the limited space of the canvas. Composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1921. Here, yellow escapes only to the right, so that this vertical plane would be horizontal in extension. Black, gray, red, and yellow frame a cluster of ambiguous white planes, which may be interpreted as a single white plane that flows continuously beneath black lines. Blue alone, the spiritual color, is bounded by a square. Each color holds its own position in the grid, but moves in or out of the canvas visually. Lozenge, 1921. Lozenge employs four horizontal and three vertical lines, but only one fully enclosed plane. The other ten planes extend off the canvas, implying conjunctions of lines beyond the edge of the painting. This imaginary closing of a plane is only possible in the lozenge format. Composition with gray and black, painting number two, 1925. There are essentially only three lines, all cutting across the full width of the canvas. Only the brief edge to the lowest planes, lower left, is added, and all planes expand off the canvas. No plane is fully defined on all four sides. Composition with blue and yellow, composition one, 1925. This painting has only three lines and two areas of color. None of the planes which this creates is bound on all sides, and consequently all the planes, whether white, blue, or yellow, appear to expand off the canvas to infinity, and the crossing of the lines takes precedence over the limiting of the planes. The largest plane is different in kind, since it is bounded upon three sides, or so Mondrian implies, for in fact he shows only one crossing point in this painting. The other is implied as occurring just off the canvas. Composition with black and blue, 1926. This is a lozenge with only two lines. The cross, symmetrical of the colored blue triangle, is seen as the base of the painting, but the artist has presented the image in the lozenge format. Composition in black and white, painting one, 1926. Composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1927, indicates a new attitude and a gradual return to complexity, 
playing off the balance of the dominant cross format and the presented square format. There are also thicker short lines and slenderer long lines. Composition with red, yellow, and blue. The bounded area remains white, while all other planes are red, yellow, blue, gray, or black. Red dominates as blue and yellow are reduced. Composition, 1929. Foxtrot, 1929. Composition in a square, 1929. This has no bounded planes, but the square is again present as the dominant plane, now extending off to the right and below. The large plane still approaches square, but does not correspond to a colored plane diagonally opposite, and is bounded at the upper left by color, terminating in a thick horizontal line along its lower edge. Composition, 1929. Composition with yellow, 1930. Composition 2 with black lines, 1930. Mondrian omits color altogether and presents only three lines. There is only one crossing and a stopped line which emphasizes the edge of the large plane. His device of enclosing the middle right plane on three sides gives it a degree of positive force as it abuts the large plane, further throwing this area into clarity of resolution. Foxtrot A, 1930. Composition with two lines, 1931. This lozenge is the artist at his most minimal. One vertical crosses one horizontal near the canvas edge. Mondrian could not reduce these means any further, but even here there is interaction and complexity. He has represented the interplay of symmetry and asymmetry in which a near symmetrical structure is tipped into the lozenge format so that its lines are vertical and horizontal. Composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1932. Composition with blue and yellow, 1931. Its clear, restricted purity of color and its dominant whites are an inexhaustible means of embodying balance. All is open, and relationships are reduced to their utmost clarity. Three lines and two colors were all that Mondrian needed. Composition C with red and gray, 1932. Composition with yellow lines, 1933. This painting is innovative in two ways at least. The lines are yellow, and they do not touch anywhere on the canvas. By extension, they meet off the canvas to form a rectangle which is only approximately square. The lines are broad and of varying widths and lengths. Each yellow band cuts off an equilateral triangle and still appears as the edge of a plane. The white central space appears to expand, positively pushing the bands outwards. Conversely, the bands press inwards to enclose the triangle. Composition with gray-red, 1935. It redefines the perpendicular in double lines that form a small white square at the core of the painting from which the narrow corridors of white stream rapidly away, becoming lines themselves and scarcely planes at all. The structure was rapidly enriched with increasing complexity of relationships and rhythm accompanying every additional line. The enclosed plane, by contrast, appears static, particularly as it is anchored by a red band, which almost forms a line in itself. Composition with red and black. Composition in white, black, and red, 1936. Verticality does not dominate, however, since a ladder-like assemblage of three horizontals joins the two right verticals. The central line of this trio is stopped at either end, while others pass through to the right edge. The enclosure of the ladder-like structure is confirmed by the heavy red, which reiterates it at the bottom. To the left, the canvas is simpler, and the vertical thrusts modulated only by the long horizontal. Composition with blue, 1937. 
The multiplicity of relationships, overlapping planes, stopped lines, and unimpeded lines creates staccato effects among a fast-flowing structure. It is an urban rhythm, perhaps architectural, perhaps musical, but first and foremost clear in pictorial terms. The latter effect is visible through the wide vertical section and through the broad horizontal section which crosses it. Composition with Red, 1939. Composition London, 1940-42. The ladder-like structure is further elaborated by planes of blue and yellow, which appear to pass beneath the black lines joining several adjacent rectangles. This suggestion of transparency and overlap encourages the eye to see other lines as passing above or beneath each other, thereby building up layers of space in the painting. There is also a small inclusion of red in the narrow margin at the far left. Rhythm of Black Lines, 1935-42. Composition 2 with blue, 1936-42. Evident at each crossing and all of its alternatives, the conjunction is evident too in the larger cross that all of these long lines create en masse. The individual part and the whole structure reflect the same pervasive principle. Only the variations employing short horizontals in the lower right disturb this, and by the inclusion of the blue, assert enough visual presence to balance the force of so many crossing lines. Composition with red, yellow, and blue, 1937. Composition in black, white, and red. Painting number 9, 1939-42. This elegant canvas sums up in a single work many of Mondrian's last compositional innovations. The three long vertical and horizontal lines elaborate the double line effect the ladder-like construction reappears, contrasted to an emptier vertical series of planes to the left, and finally, the small inserted blocks of his New York phase serve to link smaller groupings of lines. Place de la Concorde, 1938-43. Lines group to either side to vacate the central space. In addition to this framework with its broad open space above the center, Mondrian has added strips of color which suggest the underpassing and overpassing of white planes and abut the central area from below. This peripheral traffic of colors isolates the calm simplicity of the broad central areas. Trafalgar Square, 1939-43. The central area is dominated by a broad expanse of space which is clearly directional, rising like a ladder through the whole painting. The peripheral activity assembles in stacks, also intruding upwards into the area defined by the two lowest full horizontals. New York, 1941-42. New York City, 1. 1941-42. This uses only colored lines, all cutting across the whole height or width of the canvas. These three colored grids each have a specific relationship with each other. They are single color crossings in yellow, red, and blue, plus all their combinations, but the assemblage is also interwoven. As each of these three primary colors also has a spatial effect, blue receding, red firm, and yellow advancing, the painting exhibits enormous activity in which each color crossing constitutes a pictorial incident. New York City 2, 1942. New York City 3, 1942. Broadway Boogie Woogie, 1942-43. The grid forms no closed colored planes, and the lines are repeatedly interrupted by small pulses of red, blue, and white, marking every crossing and forming an agitated rhythm along the full length of each line. Mondrian has, in addition, bridged the gaps between the lines by blocks of color, which do not fill the whole vacant plane. Within these bridge panels, which are sometimes themselves subdivided into bands, 
He has in certain cases inserted smaller panels of yellow or white, placed symmetrically around the vertical axis of each grouping. Victory Boogie Woogie, 1943-44.